we're gonna go to Drake's grave in a second. We're here at Roseland Cemetery to visit Mr. Paul Dirac's dead body. We decided to come visit it for the second time. Because last time we came to Roseland Cemetery, we realized that there was over 10,000 graves. <laughs> Too many dead people. <laughs> And not only that, we brought food. We realized that Dirac did not like to eat food at all. Evidently, his father would uh, kind of abuse him during dinner time, so every time he ate, he would kind of have an urge to regurgitate it. He cursed us. Did Dirac equation uh, I, I like uh, no, mm -hmm. mathematical models, yeah. and the Dirac equation is uh, some really step forward from the classical quantum mechanics. By far the last word, and it goes to QED, QCDs, and so on. And whatever you do, you cannot avoid it, and you better enjoy it. I mean, it's a very elegant uh, formulation. But I like the Dirac equation. It's very, it's, it's. It's beautiful, uh, and for me, it's the, just the, the the beauty of the observation that you take to take the square root of this operator. Right. You immediately get antimatter, although Dirac didn't quite see it. Yeah. Uh, and you get spin. Uh, I think that was a, that was just an enormous uh, uh, contribution. Contribution, yeah. and it must have been thrilling. You know? Yeah. So in 1926, shortly after Schrodinger's equation was published, physicists started to attempt to solve the equation using uh, relative, special relativity. And to do that, they used Einstein's equation for energy. I just plugged that uh, right for the energy in the Schrodinger equation. And you can replace E and P with their operators. Uh, which then turns this equation, as you can see here, i h bar d phi dt square root of negative h bar squared del squared c squared plus m squared c to the fourth. And this is the equation where um, it gets really hard to solve. And the original attempt at solving this equation, uh, at least performed by Klein and Gordon, this is the Klein Gordon equation. Um, you come to this. And what they do there, they square both sides to get around this square root of a differential operator. Um, but doing that square kind of messes things up. You get a uh, second time derivative, which really disassociates uh, this whole equation from the original Schrodinger equation. Now, the results of this are that uh, you don't get a positive continuous probability dis distribution, and also uh, you, it doesn't allow for spin states, which is uh, pretty important, especially when you're trying to do good quantum mechanics. So there were some serious problems with this way of solving this expression. So Dirac tried something a little bit different. Instead of trying to do a workaround, he more tackled this radical directly by stating that the square root of this will be a linear combination of the linear terms. So taking the previous step, we uh, square both sides, and which leaves us with this. Continuing that out, uh, we break the momentum up into its vectors, into its components, and we square uh, this thing. And we get quite a bit out of that. Now, for this to be true, all these terms have to go to 0. These terms have to have, uh, at least the coefficients in front of these terms have to have 1s. So doing straight up algebra, this doesn't work out at all. You're not going to find a solution that will satisfy that. And this is where Dirac got real clever. He realized that, you know, what if these 
coefficients aren't regular numbers. What if they're matrices? So he fiddled around with that and he ended up finding some matrices that work. He used poly matrices to help them out. And the poly matrices work pretty well because they do have this property of uh, anti-commutation. These are uh, Dirac matrices, which are four by four matrices, where you have um, kind of like four sections, and two of them are going to be filled up by the poly matrices. And in the case of the beta term, uh, the identity matrix. Now that we know this is a true expression, we condense it down a little bit and just notice that this, uh, all the alphas and the, P, the components of the momentum can be expressed as a dot product. And there we come to Dirac's equation. Now taking this a little bit further to see uh, some of the implications of this equation, we set momentum equal to zero, getting rid of this whole term, leaving just e5 equals beta mc squared. Introducing some matrices, we have the beta matrix on the right hand side for beta, and then we also put a, a unit matrix for the energy side, and that's essentially just one. Now, with the beta, since it's already diagonalized, we get the eigenvalues right off the bat. You can just pull them right out. So we have one, one, minus one, and another minus one, all times mc squared. So these are all uh, the energy eigenvalues here. And, and those correspond to four uh, eigenstates for the system. And uh, here they are represented where you have, uh, you know, uh, for this top pair of states would represent regular matter. The bottom pair represents antimatter. And uh, you have a 1, 0, 0, 0, and then a 0, 1, 0, 0. This one represents, let's say, upspin, downspin. So you have uh, the spin up and spin down represent the regular matter, as well as spin up and spin down for the antimatter. And the antimatter here is associated with the two uh, negative mc squared uh, eigenvalues for the energy. So we saw from our derivation of the Dirac equation that a relativistic electron ha can have a negative energy, as we see in our Einsteinian energy with our negative sign. Now, there's a problem with this, which we'll represent with a thing called the Dirac C. And uh, if we can see the Dirac C, if we uh, plot an energy versus momentum graph, and we essentially just plot this equation, at the ground state, we have mc squared. Then transversely over here, another mc squared. Now, the problem with this is if we, let's say we have an electron right here, and it's interacting with a particle that makes it want to lower its energy. Well, when it reaches this point, it's going to want to jump down here and continue off to infinity. We don't know any electron that does this in real life. So the way Dirac compensated for this problem was he used a thing that we're very familiar with called the Pauli exclusion principle. And he said, well, let's say this vacuum isn't actually a vacuum, and it's actually filled with negatively charged particles, electrons. Now we have our Dirac C. Now, this brings up another problem. Well, this Dirac C, let's say we have uh, an electron in here, and it wants to promote itself upwards. And in doing so, emits a photon. Well, what it would leave behind is a thing called an electron hole, where there would be a positively charged particle. 
Now, Dirac wanted to explain this by saying, well, the only particle that we know of that's positively charged is the proton. Now, there's a problem with this that was actually recognized by a man named Herman Weil. Uh, he said that in order for the maths of this to work, the particle that's left behind has to have the same mass as an electron. So, basically, Herman Weil predicted the positron. The equation, you get the you know two negative energy solutions, but uh, apparently, like that can be thought of as you know, particles going backwards in time. A lot of people were very upset about this and say, "Well, particles going backwards in time, you are nuts." <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Yeah, then the interpretation of antimatter, well, we don't see it, so go home. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say Brian here uh, was made up of antimatter and was somehow not annihilating with the grass that he's sitting on and the air and everything else. He would actually be going backwards in time. The universe, the only reason why we have non-antiparticles, the universe is made up of normal matter because there was slightly more normal matter in the beginning of the universe than there was antimatter. So, when we talked to Dr. Hoflick, he gave us an explanation for why there are no worlds made of antimatter. And basically what he said was that formation of the universe, there was slightly more matter than antimatter. And uh, the antimatter annihilated with the matter, and all that was left was matter, basically. But one way to explain it is CP violation. Now, essentially what we learned in class with Dr. Adams was that in the example of the K, the K-on, we have two different decays that are supposed to happen with the K-on. One is a, we have a pi plus, an electron, and an anti-electron neutrino. The other decay product is the exact opposite of that, a pi minus, a positron, and an electron neutrino. Now, the idea is that both of these decays would be equally likely. But what we find out is that this one is slightly more likely. No one really understands why CP violation happens. We just know that it does happen. So essentially what we're saying here is that uh, there's an asymmetry in the decay product. Neutral kaons are not the only case in which this happens. We also find that this happens in B meson decays, D meson decays, charm decays, and neutrino oscillations. You have, what? have you ever heard of Dirac? Paul Dirac? I think I have, but if he's Jewish, he's very good with him. No, <laughs> he's not Jewish. He's not Jewish. <laughs> but he is buried over there. All those with some nice old ladies. <sighs> After his ingenious idea of antiparticles in a direct sea, he even went on to find a relation for a magnetic charge, a magnetic monopole. In Dirac's paper, the yeah. quantized similarities in the electromagnetic field. He makes a derivation which is a lot more complicated than expected. And he comes up with this relation where N is just all integers. H is the Planck constant, C is the speed of light, and E is the elementary charge. And what he found was that we have a magnetic charge. And with the magnetic charge, we have a monopole. We've in his theory, he's isolated the pole to just a charge. So one of the things Dirac, so what Dirac studied was, if I remember, he assumed magnetic monopoles existed. So what a, a magnetic monopole would be some magnetic charge, because the property that it produces a magnetic field that would look like the electric field. But it would make. But, uh, right, the electric field is an electric charge, but for, uh, but for a magnetic field. And the magnetic monopole is very, 
very interesting because when you have a magnet and you break it, you still get north and south. We don't get a north piece and a south piece in conventions of north and south. What we get is this and not this. So what Dirac was able to show is if a, if a monopole exists, then the electric charge has to be quantized. Because that's, by the way, that's something we haven't, you know, we haven't talked about in our class and no one's asked. Mm -hmm. you know, all you know, the electron, proton, all these particles have charge, okay. and it all comes in chunks of E, or E over 3, we're dealing with quarks. Yeah. You know, what, who's to, why does the proton, what can the proton be slightly more or less, you know, why is charge quantized? Mm -hmm. And essentially, if you have a monopole, the requirement that the wave function for a charged particle in the presence of that monopole be single-valued puts a quantization condition on the electron. How does the modal experiment work? By like, it, it's a bunch of plastic sheets around an impact site and by the LHCb point, and that all these plastic sheets, they are also nuclear resistant, so like they don't get attacked yeah. by nuclear radiation. Right. And the magnetic monopole is very <clears throat> highly ionizing, right, from all the calculations and whatnot. It's very, very, very powerful. So then it'll break through these plastic sheets. Yeah. And it'll leave a little track behind of what came through. So like even really just even one thing breaking through this these plastic sheets, the NTDs, um, it's already kind of showing like Something big came by here. It is most probably the monopole. That, that's an experiment that was approved in about 2007, around the end of the first decade of 2000. And I'm not quite sure if it's running yet. I'm pretty sure everybody was more excited about the Higgs boson, but if it, it is hoped to be found that we'll find a magnetic monopole through that experiment. Okay, so finally found it. I actually walked past Drag's grave like six times. But found it. Here we are. Drag's grave site. Mr. Brian Baker brought a, a rock for him. I'm putting this here rock on it's a mineral Drag's grave. Or mineral, I'm sorry. But rock sounds better. Yeah, this here mineral on top of his grave. It's a nice memoriam for Mr. Paul Dirac. Um, Dirac once said that, uh, uh, I don't, giving himself very little credit, he said that if, if he hadn't come up with it, somebody else would have. I think that's probably true. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know how long it would have taken. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was, it certainly was, you know, he, he did it in isolation. I mean, he was, I think that's true, but I don't know how I don't know how long that that would take. I, I sort yeah. of I think a lot of you know really almost after the Broglie, a lot of what happened would have happened no matter I mean no matter what. It seems like just basically he was like, well, I'm going to take quantum mechanics and I'm going to take Einstein's energy. Yeah, and, special relativity, and yeah. they must fit together. Yeah, and, and make a Lorentzian invariant. Yes. Yeah, it seems like almost anybody could have done it really. Uh, yeah, th that's, a, that's a nice thing with good theories, actually. Right. Everybody could have done it, no one saw it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, after the fact, yes, uh, you say always, oh sure, I should have the idea. Uh, everyone has an idea, it's elegant. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's really thinking outside the box, which is not so easy. Mm -hmm. It just makes the difference between people like Dirac and us here.